Hello, my name is Roger Watson and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Nurse Education and Practice and welcome to this session on Publication Ethics. In this session I'm going to look at why we need Publication Ethics, give you a very brief introduction to the Committee on Publication Ethics and then I'm going to look in turn at each of the six aspects of Publication Ethics that we need to consider and of course that authors need to avoid. First of all, why do we need publication ethics? Well, publication ethics exist to ensure high quality scientific publications, public trust and scientific findings, and that people receive credit for their ideas. So publication ethics is a multifaceted concept, and to some extent it's quite separate from the issue of research ethics, although ethical issues in research can have an influence and come under publication ethics under some circumstances. In this presentation I'm going to be dealing purely with aspects of publication ethics. Now I love this quote which is a partial quote from Aldo Leopold which says that ethical behaviour is doing the right thing when no one else is watching. In other words we should be ethical in all our behaviour related to publication ethics and everything else of course because we want to be and because we're most motivated to be, not because somebody's watching over us or policing us. So this is not something that's what you can get away with. This is about what you should be doing all the time. But why do ethical issues arise? Well, journals exist to enhance the scientific database. That goes without saying. However, they also enhance seniority and income pharmaceutical company profits and publishers profits and whenever people can get ahead or make a profit there's always the tendency or the temptation at least for unethical practices to take place and there's enough evidence to show that there's a great deal of unethical practice taking place. To help with the issue of unethical practice and publication, the Committee on Publication Ethics was formed at the end of the 1980s by the editors of the British Medical Journal and The Lancet. It's now much wider than medicine and health, and really it's the Committee on Publication Ethics that really, to some extent, sets the standards for publication ethics across the whole academic publishing industry. Not every publisher or every journal is signed up to it and some that aren't still claim that they adhere by the COPE standards, but many journals and publishers are signed up to it, and this is obvious on their, on their web pages. And those companies and those journals that are signed up to it are obliged to use the COPE guidance uh, when they're dealing with ethical uh, behaviour in publication. If you've not had time to look at the COPE web page, I'd strongly advise you to take a look. It's got a lot of useful information, it's got uh, best practices, it's got training, it's got a newsletter you can sign up to, and it's got the algorithms that editors and publishers use when specific publication ethics issues arise. Now the specific ethical issues in publication are the following. Duplication, plagiarism, falsification, fabrication, authorship, and conflicts of interest. And in the next set of slides, I'm going to deal with each of these in turn. To avoid duplication, we are not permitted to republish the same findings. In other words, the same results can't be used in two different articles. However, there are circumstances under which duplication is permitted, but these are restricted circumstances and they've got to be done with permission. For example, if you have a study in an academic journal and you want to rewrite it using the same results for a less specialised audience, maybe a clinical audience, then that is permissible. And if you want to publish your article in a different language, then that's also permissible. However, you must get the permission of the journal where the study is originally published and the receiving journals must know that the studies have already been published. 
so these are restricted circumstances and it must be done with permission. The other circumstances where people do get concerned is the duplication or self-plagiarism of methods in articles, particularly in the research articles. Uh, it's very often the case that an author will use the same methods repeatedly but in different studies and it's very difficult to avoid these being similar. So the Committee on Publication Ethics advises editors to be quite lenient in these circumstances. We do expect some rewording, rephrasing and paraphrasing perhaps of the original methods. It can't just be lifted out as it were, but we are uh, encouraged to be lenient so we tell people not to worry too much about methods sections. It's really the results that we're concerned about. We're not permitted to submit uh, manuscripts to two or more journals at once and of course the top bullet point implies that once you've submitted it somewhere and had it published you can't submit it somewhere else and have it published. So we are not allowed to submit to two or more journals at once. It leads to too much temptation to duplicate and we also sign a copyright agreement when we submit saying that we are submitting solely to that journal and that the copyright will belong to them unless we pay for open access and we also um, try to avoid this because it would jam up the editorial and review systems of the same papers were going out to more than one journal. We've got to try to avoid dividing one research project into too many small papers. This is called salami slicing represented by the uh, picture on the bottom right. That's an Italian sausage which is sliced very thinly. Now there are no hard and fast rules about salami slicing and to some extent everyone does this. If we have a large uh, multi-million pound project funded over several years it would be rather disappointing to get one paper out of it. In fact it would probably be impossible because the findings would be too large. So we do have to slice studies up to some extent but not too much. Again there's no hard and fast rules. It's up to the integrity of the researcher to publish discrete uh, aspects of the work, aspects which don't have too much overlap and to avoid deliberately trying to get papers out simply by slicing the study up into small studies. Plagiarism uh, to some extent is easier to define. It's the unreferenced use of others published and unpublished ideas. Very often both plagiarism and duplication are detected using plagiarism detection software or similarity detection software. Please note that it's not just about published work. Unpublished ideas are covered by plagiarism too. So for example ideas within research proposals are covered by this and also ideas in unpublished manuscripts are covered under this. So a reviewer who reads a nice manuscript with some good ideas and it can't say well I'm going to reject that paper and use the ideas myself that would be considered to be plagiarism. And submission under new authorship of a complete paper sometimes in a different language. This does happen and is not permissible clearly. That's a frank case of plagiarism. Now it goes without saying and I'm sure you're aware that plagiarism is very very serious one of the most serious uh, aspects of academic misconduct that you can possibly be accused of you can lose your job if you don't lose your job you will certainly lose your reputation so plagiarism has to be avoided at all costs it's very easy to avoid you simply don't do it it's impossible to plagiarize by mistake Next, falsification. Falsification is manipulating research materials, equipment or processes or changing or omitting data or results such that the research is not accurately represented in the research record. So falsification is not a case of making things up. Falsification is a case of having results but doing something to exaggerate them and basically to make them look better than they are, to make it more secure that you'll get published or that it will be cited or have more of an impact. 
Examples are ignoring outliers in quantitative research, data which may be unusual, anomalous, indeed erroneous, but will skew your results, particularly, for example, in a randomized controlled trial where it shows a difference between the two groups. So you've got to analyze with and without outliers to see if it's having any influence. Ignoring outliers is a case of falsification. Not admitting that some data are missing, quite simply giving a higher response rate, for example, in a, uh, in a survey uh, or falsifying the numbers in a clinical trial, for example. And also post hoc analysis that are not admitted, in other words, secondary analysis. This is a particular problem in randomized controlled trials where people have a primary outcome and then they go and publish several other papers using the same study but publishing different data. And this has led to papers being retracted and to jobs being lost. So it's a case of falsification. It's also a case of duplication. But another case of post hoc analysis would be using data from a survey that are intended to look at, say, differences in social class, but then wondering if there's a difference in there in some other aspect like gender, which wasn't the primary intent of the survey, and analysing that and publishing it. The thing with post hoc analysis, the thing to do is always to admit that it's a secondary analysis and to point out that there's a weakness in the study and that it wasn't specifically designed for that particular analysis. And a very serious uh, aspect of falsification, and a very serious aspect of research ethics, and this is where research ethics and publication ethics coincide, would be not including data on side effects in a clinical trial. In other words, all the patients were cured when we did the clinical trial, but they died the, uh, the next week. Not reporting that would be a gross case of falsification. Fabrication is a step beyond falsification. Fabrication is essentially making up data. So it's making up results and recording and reporting them. Quite simple. It doesn't need much more elaboration. For another form of fabrication, and I have actually seen a case of this as an editor-in-chief, is where references are included to give arguments the appearance of widespread acceptance but they're actually fake or don't support the argument. So misusing references is fabrication because you're fabricating the case. But the case I was involved in, the references are actually fake, completely made up and impossible to find anywhere. So that's a, a case of fabrication where someone's gone to great efforts to make their paper look as if it's acceptable simply by making up the supporting evidence. Next, the difficult issue of authorship. First of all, here's a set of figures over a roughly a 10 year period from COPE about the nine most common case categories of research misconduct. And I've circled authorship, which is first on the list. Authorship constitutes about 20 to 25 percent of the cases that go. The interesting thing is that it's almost constant. Other aspects of misconduct vary, but authorship is always with us. Authorship problems seem always to be with us. I can vouch for that as an editor-in-chief because the first issue I ever dealt with as an editor-in-chief, first ethical issue, was an authorship issue. They've been common throughout and probably the most common issue and I continue to deal with them. They're very damaging, they break up friendships and they tear teams apart. And at the very worst, they can lead to people not being uh, attributed properly uh, alongside their work. So where can we turn for guidance? Well, the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors has got some very clear guidance on authorship and also on conflicts of interest, which I'm coming to next. The ICMJ say that the list of authors should accurately illustrate who contributed to the work and how. All those listed as authors should qualify for authorship. 
according to the criteria which I'm going to outline now, the converse being that if they don't qualify, they should not be authors. So the person who's head of the laboratory or the dean or the professor or the head of the hospital or whatever, who, if they haven't had an active part in the research according to the ICMJE criteria, they should not be an author. So who can be an author? Well, all authors must have made a substantial contribution to conception and design or acquisition of data or analysis and interpretation of data. Please note you don't have to have done all of these things. One of them is sufficient and the extent to which anyone's contribution is substantial is a judgment for the research team alone. Everyone must have been involved in drafting the manuscript or revising it critically for important intellectual content. Again, you must have done one of these things. And if your contribution is revising it critically, that doesn't include simply editing it. It means engaging with the material and making appropriate changes where necessary to that manuscript. It's very important that everybody should give a final approval of the version to be published. It shouldn't be submitted for publication without that. And of course, it shouldn't be submitted for publication if anyone's not on there who should be on there. It's also important that everybody must take responsibility for the part of the work that they did. You don't have to take responsibility for the part that other people did, but you have to be able to stand up and take responsibility for the part of the manuscript that's yours, and therefore you must be uh, listed as an author for that reason. However, if any part of the work is subsequently investigated, it's everyone's responsibility to make sure that it is investigated and that a resolution is reached. There must be room for acknowledgements too from anyone who doesn't meet the criteria for authorship, for example, technical help, data collection, writing assistance or whatever. Other contributions that don't meet the former criteria there should be acknowledged. They don't necessarily um, qualify for authorship. And it should be the case that before the article is submitted, everyone should agree on the order in which their names will be listed in the manuscript. If you ask subsequent to submission for a change in the order or for a change in the authorship, either removing or adding people, that is considered an ethical issue and has to be investigated by an editor. We don't actually care where authors go in terms of the order, but we do care about it being changed. So we've no advice to give you on the order of authorship. You have to decide that. And there are various criteria. Different countries have got different criteria. Different subjects have got different criteria. But it mustn't be changed after submission without good reason. To get things right in authorship, the best practice around this is to consult and adhere to the ICMJE guidance. It's very clear and very simple, and at its simplest, it means people who meet those criteria should be an author and people who don't shouldn't be. Discuss the order of authorship at the beginning of the project, not at the end. Document everything in writing and make sure that all authors take responsibility for content. Here's an interesting set of criteria from the National Institutes for Health in the United States on general guidelines for authorship contributions under five headings, design and interpretation of results, supervisory role, administrative and technical support, data acquisition, writing, and other. And where it's green, that means you have the go ahead to be an author. Where it's purple, it means you shouldn't be an author. And you can see that there are degrees for some of these areas. The only two that give the green light completely, as it were, are under data acquisition, original experimental work. If you did that, then you are definitely an author. And under writing and other, it's got drafting of manuscript, and that gives you the, the go ahead to be an author. In fact, it says there that it warrants first authorship. It doesn't necessarily mean to say that you have to be. 
and for example reading and commenting on a manuscript and uh, none making no contribution uh, there you are completely barred from authorship under these criteria so it's a good uh, aid memoir to have handy for research teams when they are considering who should be authors on their papers The British Sociological Association does offer some authorship guidelines and it also offers some specific guidelines here on order of authorship. Under order of authors and the first criterion, they say, the person who has made the major contribution to the paper and or taken the lead in writing is entitled to be the first author. Again, this is an entitlement and not an absolute right to be first author that can be decided between the team. Other than that, they give some other general advice, but there aren't really any fixed criteria. And certainly, as I've already made the point, journals and publishers are not interested in the order of authorship only if there's a request for a change. Okay, finally, conflicts of interest. A conflict of interest can occur when you or your employer or sponsor have a financial, commercial, legal or professional relationship with other organisations or with people working with them that could influence your research. Full disclosure is required when you submit your paper to a journal. Now, the point behind conflicts of interest, which are extensive to be frank, and this is by no means comprehensive, is that they should be declared and not hidden. And there is not a problem declaring a conflict of interest. What it does is allow people to review the paper and read your paper in that light. But if you don't declare it and it's subsequently discovered, that can leave a very bad impression indeed. So you shouldn't worry about declaring conflicts of interest. It wouldn't preclude you from publication. Examples of conflicts of interest, and this is by no means comprehensive, are financial relationships. For example, if a drug company was paying researchers to test a drug for them using a randomised controlled trial, that's not wrong, but it's got to be declared. Personal relationships. These may occur if a researcher is married to someone or has a child or a parent working in a company that's financing their work. That should also be declared. Professional relationships, ones that may impinge on decisions, should be declared. For example, an editor-in-chief having a visiting professorship at a particular university where people are publishing in his or her journal. That could be construed as a conflict of interest if it's not declared. Where relevant, political affiliations should be declared, particularly if an article has got political implications. Sometimes religious affiliations ethical issues are not neutral or particular ethical issues are not for example the issue of abortion and some scientific issues such as evolution are not neutral to some religious affiliations so if it's considered that for example an editor was not publishing something that they didn't agree with simply on religious grounds or that people were doing research of uh, of an ethical nature that was slanted towards their particular world view then that should also be declared. I make the point that none of these things are wrong, they just need to be declared. The bottom line, as it were, the most essential thing is that you've got to think, is there anything here that may give someone the impression that your research or your decisions, for example, as an editor, as a researcher or whatever, uh, any involvement in the research and publishing process that gives the impression that these are biased? Finally, I'd like to draw your attention to nurse, author and editor, edited by Leslie Nicholl on behalf of the International Association of Nursing Editors, also known as Inane, and this journal is supported by Wiley. The contents are free. You can sign up for alerts, but you can access them directly. Most of the content is written by editors, sometimes on very prosaic issues, such as how to 
write an introduction and how to start a discussion section of a manuscript, but also issues like open access, predatory publishers and aspects of publication ethics. So I'd strongly urge you to sign up to Nurse Author and Editor. Here's my email address if you want to ask me any questions. You can check out my own publication and research record on ORCID. You can follow me on Twitter and you can also keep up with me on WeChat. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you found this session useful.